Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Mind Opener event, where we'll be exploring how urban design can affect a community's health. My name is Bridget Callahan. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Public Affairs and Civic Engagement, Enga Engagement Specialist at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. Blue Cross has been partnering with the Citizens League for nearly 30 years, and we are absolutely thrilled to be sponsoring this Mind Opener series. The Mind Opener theme this year is the Social Determinants of Health, where each of the six events in the series will be dedicated to talking about a different social or economic condition that affects health. We know that 80% of what influences our ability to be healthy happens outside the doctor's office. So where people live, work, and play, and social and economic factors like having a safe place to call home or having enough food to eat contribute to over 80% of a person's overall health. These social determinants, as we call them, are the underlying contributing factors of health inequities. And it's important to remember that these inequities are unjust and avoidable. In order for everyone to have the opportunity to attain their full health potential, we must take a closer look at how our policies, environments, and systems are designed. At Blue Cross, we're approaching this work with equal parts humility and conviction as we continue the critical work of embedding racial and health equity into the way that we do business. Today's event, the fourth of six in the Mind Opener series, focuses on urban design. Our neighborhoods and built environments shape our lives. Having access to things like parks and public spaces for walking, biking, or jogging have a really big impact on an individual's ability to be healthy and happy. And similar, similarly, one's proximity to environmental hazards plays a big role in determining health outcomes. I'm really excited for today's conversation and to hear so much more about urban design and the built environment from our excellent group of panelists. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Kunj-Bahari, Director of Public Policy at Citizens League, who will be moder moderating today's event. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Bridget. Really appreciate that and the continued partnership and support from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us um, during your lunch hour. Really, really appreciate it. And we're so excited to jump into this conversation. As Bridget said, my name is Amanda Kunchbahari, and I'm the Public Policy Director with the Citizens League. My pronouns are also she, her. And a quick housekeeping item before we jump into the actual discussion. We will be taking questions from the audience. So please send them in through the chat function on your screen and we will do our best to get to every question. If we don't get to yours, feel free to follow up with the panelists or myself afterwards and we'll be happy to address the questions that you have. So without further ado, because we don't have a ton of time and this is gonna be a really informative discussion, I wanna introduce our amazing panelists that we have today on the call. So first and foremost, we have Juana Sandoval, who is the project engineer with Tool Design. And our second guest is Cameron Bailey, who is the regional solar and environmental planner with the Metropolitan Council. Juana and Cameron, good to see you again. How are you doing today? Pretty I mean, solid. Good. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Well, I've had the pleasure, and I don't think, I'm sure the audience doesn't know this, but we've known each other for a few years now, I want to say, through different networks and connections that we've had. And I totally think you both are just amazing, phenomenal folks doing really good work out in community and within your organizations as well. But I want the audience to get to know you a little bit. So if you could, just to kind of dive in, share a little bit about yourself, whatever you're comfortable sharing, your work, a little bit about the organization you're with, if you want to talk about that as well. And then what brought you into the urban design field? So what sparked that interest? And when you think about urban design, what are you actually talking about? because it's so many different things. And so if you can break it down for our audience, I think that'd be super helpful. And either of you can start. You, you okay, make, you got I'll go line? first then. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, great, so I'll jump right in. Uh, my name is Juana Sandoval, uh, she, her. Uh, 
And I've lived here in the Twin Cities about seven years. I grew up in the other end of the Midwest, specifically Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, after getting some degrees, uh, I worked at the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is, um, you might hear of the acronym MPO uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I'll let Cameron talk more about that, but uh, he actually works at the MPO here for the Twin Cities region. Um, yeah, so I uh, ended up moving here for work. Um, <clears throat> I really like it here. Um, and my work specifically is the field of transportation planning and engineering. And I focus on sustainable transportation. I've mostly focused on walking, walking and biking options in my career uh, as much as I could. Uh, the bulk of the money in transportation infrastructure goes to very large projects, usually for cars, um, usually it's a lot of people driving alone in their cars. So uh, it's a little bit more of a niche uh, area to, to focus on walking and biking. And um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my organization, but I do want to clarify that my views are my own views and I'm not speaking on behalf of tool design during this mind opener. Uh, I work at tool design and we are a private firm we have offices in various cities all over the U.S. and a few in Canada. We are hired by the public sector, um, so cities, counties, state DOTs, um, places like the metropolitan planning organizations that I mentioned before. Uh, we're hired um, by all those different public sector folks uh, to work on projects. So sometimes we gather public input as part of the planning process. Uh, sometimes we create uh, detailed design plans so that a street will have space for buses, cars, um, bikes, and sidewalks. And um, we can talk a little bit more about it later, but uh, for me, uh, urban design is interesting to me because it's literally what we see outside in our streets and our parks. Um, and I'm a city person, so in our, in our cities especially. And I like to think of it like a movie. Um, so if you watch a movie that was filmed on a set, everything that you're seeing in each scene was chosen for a reason. So the entire set, right? There's, there's a lamp that's there, there's blinds, you know, uh, everything. It's all specifically chosen. And our physical spaces, our cities, if you think about it, it's actually the same way. It's just a much longer process to get to that point. And it's not just one person picking everything that goes into the movie set. Good analogy. Thanks, Mana. Cameron, how about you? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for kicking us off, Juana. And um, yeah, that was a really good analogy. I like that. Uh, so yeah, Cameron Bailey, he, him, his pronoun. Um, as Juana said, I work at the Metropolitan Council um, for the Twin Cities metro region. Um, and as Juana mentioned, we're a federally designated MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, which every major metro across the country does have. We're unique nationally and that we also house transit. So Metro Transit is one division of the Metropolitan Council. So the bus, commuter rail, regional rail, um, arterial bus rapid transit routes, bus rapid transit routes, Metro Mobility, dial a ride, all of those things. That's one division. Another one is wastewater treatment. So we handle wastewater treatment for a majority of residents and businesses in the Twin Cities metropolitan region. So we also have a number of ecologists and water resources people to make sure the water after we treat it is cleaner returning to the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers, as well as the St. Croix. than when um, um, a lot of times in the water that's already in those water bodies. Other things we do uh, where I work is the community development division. So we have something really special and unique in our region, which is a regional parks and trail system. So the council helps bond, um, operate and guide policy um, in partnership with um, local parks implementing agencies for these really incredible and beautiful regional park systems we have. Um, so beyond that, in my role, uh, we provide a lot of technical assistance to do long-term economic modeling and forecasting, but also long-term community development with individual, every individual city, county, and township across our seven-county metro region. Um, 
And my role specifically is working in solar energy technical assistance, environmental technical assistance, um, and the broader bander of climate resilience technical assistance, and all to support the council's explicit policy outcomes, um, which the one I center in all the work that I do is equity. Um, that's an explicitly stated policy outcome at the Metropolitan Council. So um, I, I'm glad, Juana, you brought up on whose behalf am I speaking? Like, I'm a public servant and I'm also a resident of the region. Um, it is explicitly in our policy to advocate for equitable outcomes, outcomes of livability, prosperity, stewardship. Um, so the way I approach my job, as long as I'm not saying anything, that's a lie, you know, <laughs> I'm in alignment with what I'm supposed to be talking about for work. Um, and so like how and why I do this work and how I got into it, um, as a kid, I wanted to become an engineer and build bridges because uh, I just thought bridges were these super incredible poetic structures where a bridge has to sway with the wind or it'll collapse. So you need to be built in harmony, literally the, the harmonic frequency of like nature and wind. You need to swell um, with the heat and humidity content and you need to shrink with the winter and still be able to hold people moving across you, goods moving across you, like bridges connect people. And ideally without destroying the environment. Um, so ideally urban design is working with the existing environmental context to drive how we're able to use the spaces in which we live. So uh, Juana, you actually kicked off a, a different analogy for me and he's talking about like cars, right? So it's like, if you got a family or just a group of people, like seven folk, and you need to drive five hours to go somewhere, are you going to get a Mustang GT to fit all these people comfortably? Or are you gonna get you know, a big Astro minivan, right? So the design drives the use and utility and the level of comfort um, that you're able to experience with that use. So urban design, how are we designing our environment? Whom are we designing it for? Um, and that's why like, I, I love and care about it so much as Juana said, like, that, that is your life. Like we, we are all in and of urban design. Um, so whenever you remark like, man, this is a narrow sidewalk. Somebody made a decision to make that sidewalk narrow for it to be uncomfortable for you to walk on or when your curb cut doesn't go down to the street. And like who the hell designed these sidewalks? Clearly no one with strollers. And so <laughs> that's how you start getting into that conversation of like, who's making these decisions and who for? Definitely. Thank you both so much. You just have so much experience and depth and awesome analogies that I love um, to describe the work that you do and its importance. And I want to go a little deeper into that conversation about why this actually matters, right? I think Cameron, you did a really nice job just a second ago of talking about that this is interconnected to every aspect of our lives, whether it's the sidewalk or the road or Juana thinking about walking and biking and how that impacts our lives as well. So I wanna dive deep into um, kind of understanding the connection of urban design to health and how it ties into being a social determinant of health and really kind of pulling out what you talked about, Cameron, around you know why does it matter in terms of where we build how we're building and what we're actually building and how that then subsequently impacts our lives and our well-being. Juana, do you want to go first or either one of you? Sure, I can go first. Um, yeah, so thinking about this question, um, it actually takes me back uh, really to one of my favorite childhood memories. Um, so I was a kid, uh, I was a daycare kid, and um, we went on a group walk. And um, so, you know, we're in a residential neighborhood, and uh, you can kind of picture it like the group of kids, like they're holding hands in pairs. Um, you know, we had adult chaperones from the daycare helping us. Um, I think it was mostly helping us like when we had to cross the street. Um, but uh, it's one of my favorite childhood memories because uh, on one of these walks, unplanned, uh, I saw my grandparents. Uh, and it's sort of like the first time you see your teacher in the grocery store where you, you're <laughs> seeing them, but not in the space you expect to see them in. Uh, the except most shocking it was, thing ever, I swear. <laughs> yeah, except it was much, uh, it was less weird. 
um, uh, to see my grandparents, but they were out for a walk uh, and they randomly chose the same street that my daycare walk was taking. Um, yeah, and I, I think about this today with your question um, because it meant that, you know, very small children, we were able to walk around, um, granted with some, you know, adult supervision, but uh, also the senior adults were able to, uh, able and willing to walk around. Um, so there were sidewalks, uh, we had nice trees that were giving us shade, um, the car speeds were slow enough that it felt comfortable for all of us to walk around. And we were actually pretty far from where my grandparents lived. Um, so today I would probably ask them like, oh, like where, where are you resting? Are there benches or other areas along, along your walking route where you can rest if you need to? Um, there weren't any that I remember where our little daycare walk was, but, um, uh, so this favorite childhood memory, right, this was created by good urban design. It created the scene, um, and it provided all these pieces that put together, uh, made for the perfect walking environment, um, and again, you know, just a, a good memory for me because my grandparents, they're not driving as much and they ended up walking near uh, where we were. And uh, clearly this helped their, their health. It was a direct positive impact um, for my grandparents as, as well as, as for me when I was a little kid, but probably more important for them at that stage in their life. Thank you for sharing that story. It's so beautiful. And I think a lot of us can resonate with that experience of walking together as little kids, but I think it really highlights and kind of just puts into picture that this really does impact our daily lives and a story so kind of personal and simple though, that it's so impactful. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Thanks. Cameron, how about you? I think. Yeah, yeah. So the impacts on our health, and I guess that's where, um, I mean, my interest lies um, and where it, it really has. You know, I was raised with a very strong sense of civic and social duty. Um, you know, it's like my mom was like of the generation that was forced to segregate white schools and thinking about urban design around segregation, which was, it didn't mean predominantly white neighborhoods and students were bused to predominantly black neighborhoods and schools. It meant the opposite. So for my mom, that meant she went from being able to walk to school with her friends, with her cousins, to then having to take a bus. So you think about the climate emissions component, you think about the public health component, you go from walking twice a day in community with other people that you want to walk with. So think about determinants of health in terms of movement, healthy movement, in place what's available to you with people like we know how much like strong social connections and like purpose and support um, means for health for people in society so both all of those things were taken away and then um so also being brought outside of the context of our own community as well right so um I think about that in terms of design like we decided policy decided decision makers decided that was the best way by which um, to utilize existing urban design to drive better health impacts while completely ignoring some of the biggest core drivers of public health. What, right? It's like social cohesion, sense of belonging, purpose, and um, daily movement, right? Along with like your food and diet. Um, and so, you know, I, I appreciated, you know, a comment I saw there as well, talking about urban design, like cities, but also small towns and suburbia. So, you know, with cities, um, and the cities a lot, being here in Minnesota, folk, um, there's a lot of discussion around the erosion and nutrient runoff from big ag um, in southwestern Minnesota. But big ag grows food for people in cities. So who's driving this demand, right? Who's driving the design of agriculture in rural communities and rural, rural urban town agriculture communities versus in cities? Um, people used to actually like have livestock in cities. People, way more people used to have gardens in cities. And a lot of communities in suburbs as well as urban cities 
it's illegal to have a chicken in your backyard. It's illegal to grow like a garden in your front yard, have anything other than turf, lawn, grass. Those are all design principles for that are aligning with somebody's values and thus yeah. removing the other values of a lot of other people if we used to do that. Um, so like going back to like me talking about my infatuation with bridges when I was younger, I saw bridges as something that connected people and brought people together. It was a human constructed form that allowed the flow of water and wind and natural resources and brought people movement and goods together. And what I found is actually with a bridge, think about a lot of bridges, there's no sidewalk. So think about the 35W bridge right now going across the Mississippi River over by the UN downtown. The 10th Ave bridge is closed. So there's no pedestrian way to get across that segment right now. So you got to go a mile up the street, mile down the street, because we didn't find it valuable to have a pedestrian pathway by which to cross that segment right now. Um, so like that's another design principle. So thinking, what is the barrier to entry to utilizing this bridge? Because uh, now you need a car if there's no pedestrian infrastructure. Or like when I lived in Philly, uh, the bridge closed after 10 p.m. at night. So you needed to have money to hop on the train or have enough money to have a car, pay for gas, insurance, parking, repairs, as well as pay that $10 toll going across the bridge. So we've now um, monetized and separated the utilization of the built environment across income. So we started getting determinants of health, like, all right, so you can't walk this if you work late. Um, also, it was definitely not an ADA accessible asset of infrastructure for pedestrians, hours restricted, and like really burdensome costs to get across it. So with urban design and public health as well, something else, and I know we talked about it before, is what are, what's the surrounding design infrastructure in terms of tax and finance and um, po the political design and infrastructure around who gets to make decisions at the local level. So in terms of like land use, that's a design decision to say this piece of land can only be used for a commercial property. In this city, no one is allowed to run and operate a farm. So you've now removed the ability for people to you know, like grow food where you live at any sort of appreciable scale. Um, Absolutely. So um, and then there's, there's so many other layers to that, uh, but just say like urban design informed by, as Juana said, talking about um, a lot of highway projects or just heavy road infrastructure projects. If you're getting federal money, there's federal standards, right? So, yeah. um, and priorities. So the, the urban design is influenced by at your local, like neighborhood level, you know, think about um, homeowners associations, um, then you have a city level, what your design standards are. Then you think about if it's a county road or a state road or a federal road or right of way. Um, and then like where your money comes from also decides how you can design the thing because everyone's trying to drive certain outcomes. So I think that's a big Definitely. component as well. Just like ask like, where did the money come from to finance this? Because it's probably going to tell you what priorities or what values are being prioritized in the construction of this space. Absolutely. And thank you, Cameron. That is so much good stuff that I wish I had more time to unpack. Um, but I love your example of the 35W bridge and how that, you know, the design of not having a sidewalk and a pedestrian pathway there. Um, it wasn't even something that I realized, you know, I didn't even pay attention to until you're bringing it up. And just thinking about who is designing things, where the money is coming from is such an important question and in the field of urban design, but also in any other kind of uh, public policy issue that we're looking at and talking about. So really appreciate you highlighting those things. And I wanna jump around a little bit um, from our uh, agenda that we had together. Um, and I wanna go a little deeper into that who and whose interests are being fulfilled when we think about design and where the funding has come from and why that matters. And, you know, Cameron, you talked about like the city level, the county level, and then thinking about other jurisdictions and municipalities. I want to get a little more deeper into, you know, why does civic engagement and participation matter? Like what's the intersection between those two things 
and urban design. And I think it really hits on what you were talking about, Cameron. But I really want to highlight that and go even deeper on it because we're in an election year coming up with the general election and then some local races as well. And so I'd love to help people understand, you know, like the two different organizations that you both are coming from. What jurisdiction do you have in that sense? And then why is it important that people get involved and are civically engaged? Oh, you wanna, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Either one of you. Uh, I know that's a big question. That's a big one. That's a big <laughs> one. I appreciate you bringing up where the places we work and the spaces we occupy to help yeah. bring some scoping to it. Totally. You know, so like, you know, I live in the Uptown Wedge area of Minneapolis. And so I have a city council member who is meant to be responsive to my wants and needs in my neighborhood, right? So that's a place for civic engagement to show up. I also have a county commissioner that's supposed to be responsive to my wants and needs in the neighborhood in which I live. I have a representative and I have a senator over here, as well as at the Metropolitan Council. There are council members at the Metropolitan Council that are also supposed to be responsive to the district I occupy. So in, in all of those processes, um, that's why I kind of brought up the two. There's like where the money comes from, but then there's the decision making of what we do with that money, where we prioritize. Like a number you hear a lot is that basically infrastructure to support um, and transportation infrastructure, single occupancy vehicle use, so like cars get funded at around like 10 times the rate that transit and walking do but we know that like sitting literally kills people like sitting all day will kill you <laughs> walking. However, you know, uh, everybody really get out and walk. That's basically the message we're trying to say. <laughs> get out and walk. But I mean, with that, you know, I have a lot of friends who live in different parts of the country, uh, not being from here. And what a lot of them are saying is like, yeah, man, like it actually is really rough living in New York right now. Cause there's not a ton of like parks available. There's not a lot of like water bodies that have been protected with parks and buffers around them. Like I'm so appreciative of this moment to be living in the Twin Cities because there are parks and places of like respite and healing and rest, um, not just for COVID and working indoors, but you know, just for like all the things going on in the world um, socially um, and around that, you know, like civically. And like that doesn't exist in all of the cities. Like we're pretty lucky in that regard. Um, so, you know, with like my organization, something that they just recently started doing was like, hey, we run a regional parks and trail system and we run the transit agency. But a lot of the time there isn't a pathway to take transit to the parks that we run, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or like we're, we also serve as the Gap Housing Redevelopment Authority for mostly the Northwestern Metro. Uh, so like yeah. I think Section 8 voucher holders and um, we run transit as well, right? And so, you know, it's just a very recent thing that developed the council developed a strategic team of people to like, hey, we have a lot of folks seeking housing on transit um, because we have failed in so many other systems. This is the last option a lot of people have. Oh my God, we run a housing redevelopment authority. Why don't we bring our housing resources people to our transit services mm -hmm. to help place people with housing. Um, and the council so, is doing a great job of uh, leading the way on that work, right? Within the nation, I would say. I mean, I think that's really great that they have the housing, I forget the acronym itself, but the team oh, that's that, going that, out. Yeah, the HAT yeah, team. Yeah, the, the HAT team. There we go. Team. There, there we go. Housing Thank you. Team. Yeah, they're doing a good that, that's yeah. so great. It's so dope. And what I really hope is that what it does is it builds momentum to actually um, move resources so that we don't need a HAP team because that's a triage response, right? And like, that's great that we're actually developing the infrastructure to um, help triage the failure of our housing, education, income, transportation, food, healthcare, insurance systems. Um, but also like, I would say it's not either or, we can do both. So like triage, help people where they are now. And also we're the long-term policy and economic development entity for the entire Metro region. Yep. So um, everyone on this call, actually call your, your, your Met Council members <laughs> who are accountable <laughs> to you um, and let them know what you learned about on this call and that you would want, you want to get more involved in terms of how to better align our parks 
our water systems, our transit transportation systems, um, as well as our housing um, and income and health insurance system. A great call to action. Thank you, Cameron. Juana, how about from your perspective, um, just in the experiences that you've had, and again, this question, connection and importance around civic engagement and participation with urban design? Yeah, um, uh, Cameron touched on a lot of things uh, that I agree with, so I won't repeat what he said. Um, I do think that with the civic engagement piece, um, Unfortunately, all the boundaries don't align. So um, sometimes you have to look at different maps, right? Like the county commissioner boundary may be different than the Met Council boundary, may be different than your city council reps boundary. Um, so you might have to do a little bit of digging um, to figure that out. <clears throat> Thinking back to the, the question about um, the funding, so on the on the private sector side, um, we don't control the funding per se. Um, we may try to help folks get, um, you know, seek out more funding. But um, uh, typically, you know, the the public agency will have a budget, and then they're bringing on. Um, different companies uh, like mine or other companies to, to work on the project. Um, and uh, I think uh, to, to one of the questions I see here about um, encouraging examples, contributing to community health, um, uh, Cameron beat me to it. I, I was gonna talk about the parks. Um, so basically our, our park system, um, it is, better than in a lot of other places. And it is uh, really good that so many people have a park uh, and they have a goal. I forget what the goal is, but um, you know, they wanna make it easy for people to walk to a park from where they live. Um, so I think that's a good example. We know that parks can contribute to community health because it's a green space. Um, people can do, um, exercise or fun activities there that um, get them more physical, physically active. Um, and then there was also this question about the scoping um, two to five years before the design and plan. So um, the scope of a project uh, and on infrastructure projects, you'll often hear the term project, project limits. And so that's kind of saying where the start and the end is. And so I'm glad that we got this question because it does bring up, um, you know, there may be a public meeting about something, but they've already decided where the start and end point of the project is. And so um, that doesn't mean that it can't ever change. Um, we know that people can reach out to representatives and get engaged and sometimes change a process, but the standard way that it works is that the scoping happens before. And so I think if there's something that you're interested in trying to stay involved, um, you know, to get on the newsletter that your county commissioner has or things like that to see when they do have meetings or when they are asking for input on a particular project, um, that can be a way for you to provide input and also kind of rally your friends and neighbors and say, hey, you know, we've been wanting, you know, uh, something improved in our park here. This project is going to touch on it. We, we need to let um, the folks that work for us know that this is important to us as residents here. Definitely. Thank you both. And such good calls to action to reach out and to the folks who represent us, right, and ask for these things. So I really appreciate you both sharing about that as well. Um, I want to dive into a question that we're getting from the audience and one that we've talked quite a bit about that is as relevant as it ever has been when we think about racial equity and uh, some of the racial equity disparities that we have here in Minnesota and across the nation. And in particular, um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the ways in which urban design has, whether historically or even currently, is creating racial disparities within our communities. 
And then thinking about, you know, as we vision on for the future and as folks think about the role and importance of urban design, how can it lead to a more equitable society? I know that's a big one, so either one of you. <laughs> uh, Wanna, you wanna, do you wanna hop in first or you wanna make up? Okay. Um, so how can urban design inform um, a more racially equitable society? Yeah, yeah, and how has it created created disparities, right? Um, when we think historically as well. Right, yeah, so, you know, so I, I tried to break it out a few ways earlier to kind of help tee up this, uh, this part of the conversation. So um, one, there is saying land, this like parcel of land or this area of land can only be used to do this certain activity on it, like build a house a single family house or a huge multi-family house, right? And then within that, there's design standards. So like how far back the house has to be from the sidewalk or how close it can be. Can it have an overhang awning? Can it have a sign on it or not, right? Um, and then there are things like property taxes and how they're assessed. Um, and then beyond that, you have um, things like uh, transit and like where transit's placed um, and like how wide sidewalks are required to be and what you're allowed to do on the, the land that you're, you're occupying. Um, and so in terms of like how those drive racial equity or inequities, I really like the example of um, Central Park in New York, which actually used to be um, a predominantly black neighborhood. A lot of the freed, uh, previously enslaved black folk were forced to go live in that area of the city and what a lot of folk would do, and not just black folk at the time, is like you would keep a hog in livestock. So when you fell on hard times, you had a basically a security blanket in terms of food supply, right? Yep. And so the city outlawed keeping livestock. The only people that hurt were low income people who needed that sort of food insurance policy. Um, it didn't help or do anything for, you know, at the time there really was no middle class, right? Um, we're, we're talking about like 1900. Um, so it, it definitely didn't help or hurt wealthy people and all it did was hurt poor people and we know because the history of this country of um, um, chattel slavery as well as um, indigenous genocide um, that when you look across income you see a very strong correlation with race right mm -hmm. race and class are one they're very strongly married in this country and so that policy is a policy decision that also impacted how you can use land because the environment was designed to actually accommodate growing food and keeping livestock to help keep people literally alive. <laughs> and so a decision was made um, where the environment was actually designed to accommodate that use clearly because it was being used that way. And a policy change now said, no, that can't happen. And so now you have people now who their folk I've met around the city is like, yeah, we had to advocate and push really hard to be able to have a vegetable garden in my front yard. Mm -hmm. But that's also like, that is land and food justice. So divine natural ancestry is like one of the people I really look to for inspiration. And then Twin Cities, it's three black women who really are just saying like, hey, we should be able to grow food in the place mm -hmm. that we live. And so they just like scrap together resources, time, and money from folk and grow food in the Twin Cities uh, proper and distribute that food for free to people. So there's education going on. There's a reimagining of land use. So think about like a vacant lot. And from a city's perspective, it's like, do I want that to develop into something to raise my tax revenue? Or do I want that to serve as a public social amenity? And so who gets to make that decision? You know, should it be elected officials from across the city who don't even live in that area, or should it be residents in that specific area? Um, so then, you know, start bringing up those questions of like, what is my opportunity for civic engagement, and how can my mm -hmm. civic engagement influence the use of land in the place I live, in partnership with the people around me? Definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Juana, what about you? What's your perspective on this? Um, yeah, I, I want to kind of pick up that point of, that Cameron brought up about um, reimagining. Um, 
I think that that's always a good approach. Um, uh, just to try to be creative, right? And and think of, you know, well, if if money were no problem, if there weren't any restrictions, what would we do? And then, of course, that's usually feels too idealistic. But if we can imagine that point, then, you know, we can see, well, well, what are ways that we could get pieces of that? Or how can we work towards that? Um, and I think that, um, we have a lot of changes that are happening right now. Um, I mean, we're, we're seeing directly um, impacts of COVID, right? Um, fewer people are driving to their workplace because they're uh, working from home. Not everyone, but a lot of people that are in office jobs are able to work from home. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean everybody. Um, and obviously there's a class part to that, but, um, you know, so we have uh, things like this pandemic. Um, we have things like climate change. Um, we're going to see impacts on uh, the economy, which affects budgets for different um, public agencies. Um, city, I'm thinking of cities in particular, but um, so there's, there's going to be some changes. And so if we can take that opportunity to kind of reimagine, well, what, you know, it doesn't have to be the status quo. Um, you know, if we just think of COVID, when COVID is over, do we want to just revert back to how things were before COVID? Um, like in my field, thinking about transportation, um, you know, and I, I, I think the answer is no, right? But I mean, it's an it's a opportunity to try to think of, well, if we're shaking everything up now anyways, how can, how can we make it better? Um, and yeah, I just think that there's a lot of impacts that, um, you know, we, we may not even think about. Um, so recently there was a National Geographic article that came out um, and they talked about uh, redlining. Um, and so if you have areas that are, have been historically marginalized and there's a lot of racial inequities that are, um, were specifically the point of it, um, they actually overlaid a map with where redlining happened and where um, you have higher temperatures, right? So if you think about, um, there's the urban heat island effect. So we already have climate change going on, but if on top of that, the temperatures are even higher in areas that were redlined, um, you know, that's an impact that um, I personally had not really ever even thought of until I saw this article. Um, so I think uh, once you kind of start looking for um, how these inequities come out, um, you, can, you can start seeing it in more areas and seeing more places where we need to do uh, work to improve things. Definitely. Thank you both. Um, I feel like there was a theme that came out around reimagining and, you know, thinking about COVID and thinking about um, the reckoning of our racial history and kind of what's going on now in our world. Um, I think people are in a place where they really want to feel some level of hope. And so I want to dive into kind of thinking about specific examples where you've seen urban design really promote community health and well-being, as well as examples where you've seen, um, you know, politicians and community members and whoever else from different sectors come together to push those solutions forward. Do you have anything kind of top of mind that you can think of related to that? Um, there's one example uh, I'll give briefly. Um, so, again, I'm kind of uh, one track mind, always talking about transportation. Um, so, so we know that um, highways were built in this country, and I don't want to go too much into that. And I think you actually have another mind opener about that locally. Um, but, you know, at one point in our country, we didn't have highways. Now we have highways, so they got 
um, built. And there was a big push um, to build them um, and to build more of them. Uh, I think it was in, I want to say the 70s. Um, this is actually before my time. But um, so basically in every major city, um, they were grappling with this and it was coming from multiple places, but uh, you know, the, the federal government had a plan um, for this. And actually in the Boston area, uh, there was a lot of grassroots um, community organizing and they said, no, we don't want more highways. We actually want investment into transit. And um, I don't remember all the specifics, but basically they were able to organize enough so that they could convince some of the policymakers, the elected officials at the top to like relook at this. Um, and so the way that the money had been presented back to Cameron's point about, you know, who is funding this and what are their priorities, the way it was presented was this is a pot of money for highway building, but they were actually able to say, well, the point of the highways is to move people around. It's for transportation. And so um, we can move people around with our transit system. So we want this money to go into expanding our transit system. And um, they were successful. Um, it doesn't mean that they stopped building highways there, but at least they were able to stop some of them and um, put the money into transit, which is uh, honestly kind of surprising that they were able to do it. But uh, that's a good example to look up from Boston. Thank you, great example. Yes, really good example. Um, and thank you because you, <laughs> thank you, Wanda, you helped me think of one. Um, one I really like and, you know, keeping relevance to like my own um, employer um, is the Green Line, right? Um, light rail that runs between downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul. When that, the plans originally came out for that and the plans to move forward with construction, there were a fraction of the stops along University Ave. Um, going through like Midway Hamlin and Frogtown um, that there are today. And so uh, the council and Metro Transit was not planning to put in more stations. They were planning for it to be faster. And then as those who are familiar with that corridor in St. Paul, there's a lot of black and Southeast Asian and um, Latinx folk who live in that corridor. And they organized and said, no, you're not going to, within a mile from I-94, where you plowed through a predominantly black neighborhood with um, a legal tool called eminent domain, when there was another alignment option, but as you said, Juana, different conversation. Um, <laughs> you're not going to repeat history and then force yeah. this light rail through our neighborhood and not provide us a sufficient amount of stops when this is a high transit use corridor and high transit use community. So people organized and demanded the council include more stops and stations. And even though, you know, that made the route less efficient because it couldn't get from downtown to downtown as quickly, um, what people actually wanted and were valuing was more, just more transit infrastructure, more access to this light rail. Give us more access to these billions of dollars that the region and the country is investing to move people to and from jobs. And so like, I think that's an incredible example of people organized and um, decided to figure out how to get their needs met. And it wasn't saying we don't want this, it was saying this is what we do want. So, you know, being able to shift from a defensive mindset of like, this is what we don't want, and then shift it to a constructive mindset, but this is what we do want and need. It's similar with the Better Bus Stops mm -hmm. program um, where, um, community organizers came together and said that the transit infrastructure is insufficient um, and predominantly like black and uh, Latinx neighborhoods. Like we use the most transit, why do we have the, like, the least infrastructure in place in terms of like an actual bus shelter, right? To like protect you from the elements. Um, so those are, I think like two examples that are pretty closely tied to infrastructure. <laughs> And yeah. the, the urban design, right? It's like, if you're going to give transit, give people yeah. shelters. Um, Definitely. Make it easier to utilize the infrastructure. Yeah, appreciate that. And I had no idea about the, the lack of stops. And um, I think it speaks to the power of people coming together. And again, 
organizing and asking um, their elected officials and communicating with the folks making these plans, like you both have been saying, to really be engaged and um, civically participate and look at the change that, that can create. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One more, um, COVID, social uprisings, yeah. right? I saw literally tens of thousands of people come together without government, without foundations, and without like the Met Council to raise money, to raise human capacity mm -hmm. and ability to organize and basically create pop-up grocery stores in lots of land that were not designed for that use. So Juana, when you talked about like reimagining what's possible, um, that has been so inspiring for me to be like, that's what people power is. That's what collective mm -hmm. power can do. It can supply something that, um, yeah, I mean, just like, it, it just showed all the latent power, the yeah. potential power that exists, just waiting to be converted into kinetic, actionable energy. Um, so that's a super relevant one that's like right now across design, across land use, across food systems, across health. Yeah, really appreciate that. And I really appreciate your, um, you making the connection, Cameron, to food justice, because we had a mind opener on food justice last month. Yeah, and so the recording is online. I got to put in the plug here. Um, <laughs> but we will also, I know Juana and Cameron mentioned, um, you know, thinking about the Rondo neighborhood and being a predominantly black thriving neighborhood before 94 went through. We will be having a conversation specifically on that, uh, I would say sometime in October. So sign up for our newsletter and you'll get more information about it as well. Um, we're running low on time, which I thought, because this is just such a good conversation. I want to apologize if we did not get to your question. Um, feel free to follow up with us separately. Happy to answer and provide any feedback. But before we close, um, I know you talked a little bit about ways that people can get involved and just the importance of being civically engaged, calling your local elected officials and um, voicing you know, any concerns that you have or feedback that you have about plans when it comes to urban design. But I, I just wanna open it up, um, kind of fire around here. If you have anything else that you want to tell the audience as ways that they can get involved, and also, if there's any kind of last parting words or um, thoughts that you have that you wanna you wanna put out there, feel free to do that now as well. Yeah, um, the terms feasibility and viability and efficiency are um, those are very flexible and adaptable. Um, so, one of what you said, just like having the audacity to be imaginative and creative and explicit in terms of like what does the most healthy, joyful society look like for me and the people around me? And start from there rather than starting from, well, in terms of like the budget, in terms of what it currently is and state building code and international building code and all these other things. It's like you'll feasibility constrain yourself out of doing anything new. Um, so like working energy in the environment, it wasn't feasible to, um, you know, like build the modern electrical grid. But we did because, you know, that yielded better public health outcomes for people. Um, so, like, be courageous and audacious in, in terms of, like, no, this is actually what I, I want to see and feel on a daily basis um, in my life and in community with others. I love it. I feel like I'm at an inspirational, like, TED Talk. <laughs> This is so good because this is not just for urban design. This, these are pieces of advice for everything. So I appreciate you, Cameron. Juana, how about you? Um, well, thank you, Cameron. You, I think you put in more eloquent words what I was trying to say before. So I um, appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think it's just um, you're thinking back to health, um, you know, there's there's choices that we make every day that impact our health. And again, you know, I'm personally more focused on the transportation uh, piece of that, but there's there's other pieces to it that we've talked about today. And um, yeah, I think it's just, um, it's really important to remember that um, when we're trying to push things and we're trying, if we're, if we're all in that um, realm of like the grassroots, like the community um, pushing up, 
uh, it's good to remember that um, I think one of the biggest barriers sometimes is political will, but that means that we can push um, the folks who need to have more political will, you know, we can, we can show them like, no, there's a massive group of people that want, you know, these improvements um, so that they feel more comfortable in uh, taking that step that they need to take. Um, so yeah, and I would just uh, also say for folks, um, if you're having trouble kind of reimagining um, how things could be, um, you could kind of go in the reverse um, and think about like, what's your favorite memory of like being in a city or being in a small town, um, you know, whatever, whatever your um, background has been, um, because there's probably things in that, um, the, the same way that I shared my story, there's, there's going to be things in that, that, yeah, you know, that was a, a healthy environment and there were these specific pieces that made it healthy and how can we recreate that in our um, environment today and wherever you're living. Love that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Juana. And I love the idea of us kind of reimagining that you both talked about, but also going back to our memories and what we enjoyed about um, our childhoods or just the way that urban design has impacted our lives to date. So huge thank you to the both of you. Um, really, really appreciate you being on here and dropping so much knowledge and wisdom. I'm gonna turn it over to Bridget. We got about two minutes to close us out. Um, and thank you all again for being a part of the discussion today. Bridget. Thanks, Amanda. Um, you know, just thanks for leading us in this uh, really amazing, deep, complex, but as you were saying, inspiring conversation as well. Um, and thanks, Juana and Cameron, not only for your time, but for sharing your expertise and really valuable uh, experiences with us as well. I think one thing I took away really is um, these calls to action at the end about how, you know, you matter and can make a difference by getting involved in the civic engagement process. Um, you know, we all have that opportunity and can leave with that here today. Uh, so I'll just end by saying um, thanks to all the attendees who joined us. Um, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. I think one of the reasons Blue Cross has been so excited to partner with the Citizens League and sponsor this series is because that we, you know, we know in order to do this work, to improve health, advance equity in Minnesota, we can't do it alone. So being all together for these conversations um, and really, uh, you know, reimagining what the future can look like together uh, is really special and really important. So as Amanda said, there's two events left in the series. Uh, please look to the Citizens League for, uh, for future communications on that. Um, and we really hope you can join us for those events. Thank you all so much.